The 1976 Miami Dolphins began with six consecutive preseason wins. And following six straight years of 10 or more regular season victories, continued success seemed assured. But when the Dolphins opened their bicentennial season on a Monday night in Buffalo, the main topic of conversation was the sudden return to the Bills of O.J. Simpson, an NFL star of some magnitude. Only once did the juice get loose. In fact, it was the spirited Dolphins who rolled up the yardage, 400 yards worth. Fullback Norm Boulash led the way with more than 100 yards on the ground. The season's first touchdown was scored by halfback Benny Malone, and the 1976 Dolphins were on their way. Quarterback Bob Greasy hit 13 of 21 passes, including a spectacular touchdown to wide receiver Nat Moore, and the Miami offense looked just about unstoppable. But the Dolphins' once impregnable pass defense began to show the first signs of leakage, and this was a malady which would return to plague them throughout the season. All through the night, every time the Bills would score, the Dolphins would come right back. And in an offensive splurge for the Monday night national audience, Miami finally prevailed 30 to 21. Counting preseason, the Dolphins had won seven consecutive games. Joe Namath and the New York Jets came to Miami for the Dolphins' home opener, in which Charlie Babb's third quarter interception was the game's most critical play. The Dolphin defense, in fact, effectively sealed off everything the Jets tried to do, while on offense, the Miami running attack, led by Benny Malone, controlled the game with more than 200 yards on the ground. The game's only touchdown was scored by tight end Jim Mandage as the Dolphins rolled past the Jets 16 to nothing and looked forward to big times ahead. In Miami, two more pretty fair offensive clubs went at it. The power drive of Norm Boulash had the Dolphins in front 14 to nothing at the half. But then Ram quarterback James Harris put on the performance of his life as did wide receiver Ron Jesse, number 81. Harris and Jesse combined seven times for 220 yards and two touchdown bombs. In all, Harris completed 17 of 29 for 436 yards. Trailing 28 to 21 midway in the fourth quarter, Bob Greasy cranked up this beauty to Nat Moore to tie the score. Three plays later, James Harris faced third down and the game's most important pass. Harold Jackson's clutch reception took the ball within easy field goal range. And Tom Dempsey, who had missed three earlier attempts, booted home the winning points for the first place powerhouse called the Los Angeles Rams. Entering the fourth week of the season, the Dolphins were two and one and ready to show a national TV audience how they stacked up against the three-time NFC West champion Los Angeles Rams. Norm Boulash helped Miami to a 14 to nothing halftime lead. And for an appreciative Don Shula, it was an exhilarating moment. But in the second half, James Harris and the Rams found the Achilles heel of the Dolphins, the deep pass defense. 
Ron Jesse's 58 yard play finally put the Rams on the scoreboard. But a Larry Little block sprung Stan Winfrey for his first NFL touchdown. And Miami was back in control at 21 to 7. But then Ron Jesse did it again, this time scoring on a disputed juggling catch at the back line of the end zone. Suddenly, finding themselves behind by a touchdown, Bob Greasy and Nat Moore put together a fourth quarter drive of just two plays. And despite a sprained finger on Greasy's passing hand, the Dolphins tied the game at 28. James Harris behind playbook perfect. Is a first down. The ball now on the Ram 22. Winfrey gets the call. Breaks down to the 15. And the is brought down by Monty Jackson. Malone gets the call and got the Dolphin first down. Down close to the 10. Brooks getting up from underneath the pile. I'd imagine you'll find Youngblood down there somewhere, too. And first and 10, Miami on the Los Angeles 11. Greasy's going to go, and he's got lots of room. Down to just shy of the one-yard line. Five years ago, he would have challenged those tacklers. Pat, the main thing is, if you go too early, you're in trouble. If you go too late, you're in trouble. And he knows just about when to act like he's throwing it and now go. And it's the second rush in by the defense. And now he knows that he's really, really pushing it now. They want him so bad to stand up. He got very close. Boulash over the top. Got very close. That time left I gave you just a second ago is remaining in the third quarter. Bob Greasy. Malone and Boulash, the setbacks, and Malone. No, this is Winfrey. This is the score. Andre Tillman to the top of your screen, the big tight end. And Larry Little leads him through the hole. Look at that. Look at 66. That is Jim Youngblood that he just shadowed as they have controlled the football against the Rams and lead by two touchdowns. There comes the blitz. Outside Malone, and he fell down. Boy, was that ever set up. How did Youngblood, how was he the one that came over and touched down Benny Malone? Now again, that's regular grass. Benny just got everything all tangled up. Yeah, had some blockers in front. Well, he did. Now watch Jack Youngblood. He picked up here by Boulash. Get us a screen. Now the ball's already gone. Most guys would quit, right? Not the darn Rams. Dreyer goes over and he's got his buddy there watching, making sure. Play lost four yards, so it's second and 14. Time of protection holds. First catch of the day by Nat Moore as Greasy laid it right in there. He scares me as has that sudden burst. He is to the top of your screen coming straight across. And watch where it catches it. He doesn't even see or hear these people. He's a fearless, fearless little receiver, I'll tell you. He is tough. Played his high school football right here in Miami. In the pickup. Dolphins are in Ram territory with just under six and a half minutes left to play in the game. Easy back. Again, good protection. Firing deep this time again for Moore. He's out there. Touchdown. Forty-seven yard strike from Greasy to Moore. Top of the screen. A deep post pattern, a beautiful throw by a guy who is supposed not to have a big arm. That's from about the 45-yard line. And I mean, it is a spaceship. Watch the catch. Matt Moore's 
17th catch of the year. That's 51 and a half yards right on the button, and I mean on the numbers. What a strike. And I've got it show six minutes and 17 seconds left to play in the game. It's the Dolphins 28, the Rams 28. Pass protection finished a 436-yard afternoon with another long pass. This time to the other wide receiver, Harold Jackson, whose catch set up the last-ditch field goal, which ended one of the wildest games of the year in the NFL. The following week, another national TV audience found the Dolphins in Baltimore to face the team and the man they knew they must defeat in order to have any chance for a division title. The Dolphins weren't able to pressure Burt Jones often enough as he completed 11 of 14 passes and the Colts built a 28 to seven lead early in the third quarter. In the second half, Earl Morrill replaced the injured Bob Greasy. And the man who was second only to George Blanda in NFL games played, heaved a bomb to Nat Moore for 67 yards, the Dolphins' longest play of the year. Trailing 28 to 14, Morrill and the Dolphins almost scored on a pass to Howard Twilley, but somehow it was just not to be. For perhaps the first time all season, the realization was beginning to sink in. For so many reasons, the glory years were going to be harder than ever to recapture. Dolphins turned to 42-year-old Earl Morrill in the second half, and for a moment, the game's elder statesman tapped a reservoir of that old come-from-behind magic. But Morrill's fine pass and Nat Moore's finer individual effort merely reopened an issue that the Colts thought they had settled earlier in the afternoon. Friends. Next, the Kansas City Chiefs visited Miami for week six of the NFL season in a match between two of the league's most potent offensive teams. Greasy hit 25 of 35, including a fourth quarter touchdown to Howard Twilley, which gave Miami the lead 14 to 10. But then the big play Chiefs came up with one of their biggest, a 59-yard end around by Henry Marshall, which gave the Chiefs the lead 17 to 14, with just two minutes remaining in regulation time. Then Bob Greasy found Howard Twilley three more times for the yardage that enabled Twilley to surpass the 3,000 mark for his career. And more importantly, enabled Garrow Yopremian to kick for the tie from 27 yards out with just nine seconds left. At the Chiefs' seven-yard line with two minutes left in overtime, the football and probable victory were pried from the grasp for Norm Boulash, whose fumble was his only fumble in 150 plays for the season. At the time, Boulash was playing despite a shoulder separation which would sideline him for the next two games. But there was no consolation for the snake-bitten Dolphins who had played their hearts out in the game that more and more reminded everyone of a ghost of Christmas past. In 1971, the Dolphins had begun their first run to postseason glory with a field goal in sudden death overtime. 
And now, Jan Stenerud, who had missed a potential game winner in 71, would have another shot. Stenerud's kick bounced off the upright with just 17 seconds left. And the Chiefs had won the strangest game of the NFL season, 20 to 17. In Miami, when it rains, it pours, as Don Shula's Dolphins found out last Sunday. Miami uncharacteristically turned the ball over five times, and just as uncharacteristically turned the lead over to the Kansas City Chiefs with just two minutes left in regulation time. As most of you know by now, this Otis Taylor look-alike is a rookie wide receiver from Missouri named Henry Marshall. And his 59-yard run gave Kansas City the lead 17 to 14 with 1.45 to go. But then a ghost of Christmas past appeared before the Chiefs. Garo Yapremian, the man who ended the NFL's longest game on Christmas Day, 1971, this time sent the game into overtime. In overtime, the Dolphins rolled up four straight first downs and were about to repeat some history when suddenly linebacker Billy Andrews pulled the ball away from Norm Boulash. Rookie cornerback Tim Collier recovered in the end zone for Kansas City. And out of the confusion came the sudden realization that the season may be about over for the Dolphins. With just 17 seconds left in overtime, it was only poetic justice that Jan Stenerud should get his chance, because in that same Christmas Day game, it had been Stenerud who missed from 31 yards to send the game into sudden death. Stenerud's kick bounced through from 34 yards, and remarkably, the Chiefs had won two in a row, while the Dolphins had lost three in a row. As Stenerud said after the game, I had a deep personal reason for wanting to make this field goal, but nothing can ever make up for that other one. Dick Anderson returned from knee surgery and made an important interception in the victory over Tampa Bay. Often scored only a single touchdown against the tough young New England Patriots. But Bob Greasy's 16-yard hookup with tight end Jim Mandich proved quite enough. At the bottom of the screen, number 81, Russ Francis, knew he'd committed a no-no on this play, but quarterback Steve Grogan and wide receiver Marlon Briscoe didn't. Sadly for New England, Marlon's sideline scamper went for naught. A crushing offsides call wiped out Briscoe's game-tying play. Worse yet, it derailed New England's playoff express. Whose failure to secure possession has helped to bury them in the rubble of a losing year. Fumbled snaps and dropped passes forfeit first downs and occur so often, they seem to be written into the Jets' game plan. However, against the Miami Dolphins last Sunday in Shea Stadium, the Jets were not the only ones guilty of muffed opportunities. The Dolphin defense, too, showed a knack for producing a blooper. But fortunately, their offense was displaying nearly perfect execution. And it was this which carried them to a 27-7 win. After six games, the Dolphins' record was an unbelievable two and four. 
And even more unbelievable was the fact that eight players had already been lost to knee surgery. In fact, three linebackers, Mike Colon, Ernest Roan, and first-round draft choice Kim Bocamper, were lost in preseason. And another linebacker, Andy Selfridge, was lost in the opener. Every one of them to knee surgery. In all, 22 men missed playing time that added up to 144 games. And Manny Fernandez missed the entire season. Despite all the injuries, the Dolphins suffered through their frustrations and split their final eight games, actually outscoring their opponents along the way. But frustration was the keynote, as four of the Dolphins' losses were by a combined total of just 11 points, including a loss to the division-winning Colts by the margin of one blocked extra point. Cleveland Browns were still in the thick of a fight for a wild card berth. The Browns combated the biting cold, the absence of Greg Pruitt, and the always well-prepared Dolphin defense with the passing of Brian Sipe, the bellwether of their championship drive. Although Sipe threw three interceptions, he twice managed to dent the steely Dolphin defense with touchdown passes. One went to number 33, Reggie Rucker, the Browns' leading receiver, and the other to Paul Warfield, that magnificent relic whose greatness spans the glory years of both the Browns and the Dolphins. The heroics of Sipe and Warfield led Cleveland to an important 17-13 victory, but in no way did it diminish the effort of a Miami team crippled by injury. Each week, Miami straggles in like so many weary survivors from a Hollywood disaster movie, losing a man here, injuring a knee there, but always putting out the maximum effort. Led by number 32, Benny Malone, the most reckless of this crew of headless horsemen, the Dolphins almost cashed in Cleveland's dwindling playoff hopes. Injuries and defections have depleted every skill position except quarterback, where Bob Greasy still throws footballs through a needle's eye. The Dolphins scored three touchdowns, but unfortunately only two counted when Freddie Solomon's 76-yard punt return was denied by a penalty. For the Dolphins, it was another defeat with honor. For Cleveland, it was a narrow escape from being left out in the playoff cold. Browns 17, Dolphins 13. Naturally, the object of the Miami Dolphin defense was to stop O.J. Simpson. They failed miserably as the incomparable one rushed for 203 yards, including this 75-yard touchdown burn. While O.J. rocketed around like a phantom jet, the Buffalo Bill defense resembled a jumbo cargo plane in a 60-minute holding pattern. Airborne, the Dolphins scored easily and often and rolled up 45 points. The real thorn in Buffalo's hoofs was number 86, fast Freddie Solomon, the Dolphins' wide receiver, return specialist, and ICBM, who scored three long-range touchdowns.
The first score came on a 79-yard punt return. The second resulted from a Hail Mary pass by Don Strzok that ended quite righteously in the heavenly hands of Solomon. To document his status as a bona fide triple threat, Solomon's last score came as a runner when a double reverse climaxed in a 59-yard touchdown. While Fast Freddy's bravura performance may have temporarily saved Don Shula from his first losing season, in which is John Sandusky, Howard Schnellenberger, and Carl Tassif, the passing game provided most of the excitement in 76. Youngsters like Andre Tillman, number 87, and second round draft choice Load McCrary, number 80, were excellent insurance at the tight end position. While on third down from any position, number 20, Larry Seipel, came through with some pressure plays. One of Bob Greasy's favorite clutch receivers was tight end Jim Mandich, number 88, who scored the only touchdown in the hard-fought victory over New England, and once again lived up to his acrobatic reputation as Mad Dog Mandich. Bob Greasy completed 60% of his passes, despite his own injuries and injuries to most of his wide receivers, including the last of the original Dolphins, number 81, Howard Twilley, who departed in mid-season for knee surgery. The team's leading receiver, Nat Moore, number 89, played a big part in both victories over the Jets. But in the second Jet game, Moore was forced out by a broken leg. The loss of Twilly and Moore opened up a starting role for rookie wide receiver Duriel Harris, and the unheralded Harris made the most of his opportunity. Uriel Harris, who led the NFL in kickoff returns, showed he also has the ability to become an outstanding pass receiver. And then there was the man they simply call Fabulous. Number 86, Freddie Solomon spent the first half of the season recovering from kidney surgery. But then the second year sensation from Tampa turned on the afterburners. And there aren't many afterburners in pro football or anywhere else that can keep up with the electrifying efforts of wide receiver Freddie Solomon. In the rematch against Buffalo, quarterback Don Strzok found Freddie Solomon five times for more than 100 yards as the Dolphins rolled up 45 points and defeated the Bills for the 14th consecutive time. But it was Freddie Solomon who stole the show as he accounted for 252 total yards, including three touchdowns of 50 yards or more, an accomplishment that will place him in the NFL record book alongside names like Gail Sayers and Billy Cannon. Despite some outstanding performances, it was not a pleasant season for the Dolphins. While most observers were sympathetic to the siege of knee injuries, which so obviously handicapped them, Coach Don Shula won't wait for an orthopedist to cure the problems. Anyone who knows pro football knows that Don Shula's Dolphins will be back. It's only a matter of time.